Hello YouTube, welcome back to Brunger Builds. Today I'll be showing you how I built this life-size BD droid with a working projection lens, lights, and sound. <laughs> Alright, to start off, this projection lens is sort of the centerpiece of the build. I spent quite a bit of time online trying to find one with the right dimensions, and this one ended up working out perfectly. Links for everything I used in this project will be in the description. I purchased a few other power cables and adapters online to get the whole thing up and running. It is a 12 volt DC to a splitter with one end going to the projection lens and the other going to the LEDs and sound. This lens was almost made for this project since it's got a removable planet projection slide and actually came with quite a few of these slides with various images on them. Here you can see the image I ended up going with, which is just a picture of Earth. I was hoping that I might be able to print my own planet projection slides using images of planets from Star Wars. But after some quick photoshopping and printing on clear acetate paper, this proved to be not nearly the same quality as the slides that came with the lens. So I abandoned that idea fairly quickly. This project was also the first time I had worked with LEDs or any sort of electricity. So needless to say, I was a little wary to begin soldering and connecting all the lights. So I spent a significant amount of time with a breadboard, just trying to get the hang of how these LEDs needed to be wired. I didn't exactly know how many resistors I would need per how many lights. And so I did a ton of tests beforehand. I ended up going with one resistor per light just because that seemed to be the smartest move from all the videos that I watched. It was probably a little overkill, but better safe than sorry, I guess. I also did some quick experimenting with coloring the LEDs different shades of green and blue. Because I wasn't very confident working with electricity, I had my buddy Sparky Mark over. He's got his own YouTube channel, which I will link down below. Wiring up multiple LEDs was kind of a new thing for both of us, and so we spent quite some time kind of figuring out exactly how we were going to approach this. But in the end, the solution was pretty simple. The 3D file that I was using came with a lighting solution that was essentially just a tray with holes that fit the 3mm LEDs with even smaller holes to separate the positive and negative lead of each LED into different rows. Here, Mark is soldering a resistor to every positive lead for each LED. From there, we wrapped each positive lead in heat shrink and soldered some longer wires onto every negative lead. We also wrapped these with heat shrink. In the end, it was a fairly straightforward solution. As you can see, all the negative leads are tied in together and all the positive leads tie into each other. And fortunately for us, everything worked perfectly on the first try. And just to be sure the monstrous mess of cables would fit inside BD's head, I did a quick dry fit. And from there, I went on to coloring each LED using a UV cured resin dyed with alcohol dyes. Because I'm new to LEDs, I didn't want to bother with the hassle of figuring out the different voltages for different colors of LEDs, and I figured this would be the most simple solution. I ended up going back and recoloring most of the green LEDs blue, since I thought that looked best. It was now time to begin figuring out exactly how all of these pieces went together. Fortunately, the file that I was using came with pretty foolproof instructions. I'll be sure to link these Thingiverse files in the description. Like I said, these files came with a fairly straightforward instruction booklet, which made piecing everything together very easy. And I was sure to mark which pieces were left and which pieces were right. And then from there, it was just 
sanding, sanding, and more sanding. I wanted to be sure that all the flat pieces that needed to be glued together would have a good surface to bond to each other with. And so I hit all of them with a quick 400 grit and did some cutting and shaping of some pieces that weren't fitting properly because my prints were a bit sloppy. I then began assembling the pieces I knew would need to be together before filling, priming, and paint. You'll notice that some of these pieces are filament printed, while most of the more detailed parts are resin printed. For the pieces I knew would be less visible or easier to clean up, I just went with filament printing. But for all the pieces that had more intricate details, I wanted to be sure that I got all that clean detail with resin printing. You'll notice that most of the leg pieces are resin printed, and that was to try and save myself some post-processing time and not have to deal with so much filling and sanding. But once they were glued together, some of the leg pieces did need some sanding and filling just to clean up the gaps between the two pieces. Most of the pieces did have one side that needed some extra attention because that was the side that the supports were removed from. And here you can kind of see an example of the edge cleanup that would be required to get the filament piece and the resin piece to have a clean seam and be flush to each other. This was only my second time sanding and filling a filament print, but I had definitely learned my lesson from my last helmet build and was sure to remove as much excess filler as possible so that I could save myself some sanding time down the road. Here you can see a quick before and after example of a filled part. In order to preserve as much fine detail in these prints as possible through the sanding, filling, and priming process, I was sure to go back through the nooks and crannies with a small file to remove any wood filler that shouldn't be there. I used the same method on all the pieces that were glued together, using wood filler to fill the gaps and then sanding everything flush. Here you can see some extra wood filler has been added to fill a few more problem areas. And with a little bit of elbow grease, all the parts are nice and filled. And from there, I moved on to using some filler primer just to fill in any more small imperfections that might be there, making sure to mask off the areas that I didn't want any filler in. This is a fairly standard process when it comes to working with 3D prints, so there's a million tutorials on YouTube already. But if you're interested, I will be dropping more in-depth videos for each process in this build. And here we have everything primed and ready for one last go of sanding before paint. I hit everything with a quick wet sand at 1000 grit just to keep the dust down. Again, making sure to remove any primer from the fine lines and details in the prints. Most of the small resin prints were ready for paint as soon as the primer had dried, and most of these pieces will be dry brushed with metallic paint later on, and so they need a quick coat of black semi-gloss to really sell that metal look. From there, I just started blasting everything with white semi-gloss enamel. I had quite a bit of trouble with this paint being very runny, so I'll be sure to use a different product if I need white again. And here we are getting closer and closer to the finished product. Here I am masking up BD's ears. I had planned to airbrush the red paint, but because I hadn't practiced with an airbrush yet, I got scared and just brushed the paint on. This was sort of the beginning of painting the finer details of BD, and so there was a lot of masking, painting, waiting for that paint to dry, and then painting a different color on top. Here I am cutting out pieces of masking tape for what will eventually become the details on BD's visor. The idea is that I can cut out the exact shape that I need, mask around that, remove this masking tape, and be left with a negative space that is the shape that I need to paint. And here I am first day with the airbrush. Only moments before had I figured out how to get the thing working. Dealt with lots of clogs and figuring out the proper ratio of thinner to paint. 
Some of the paint jobs were cleaner than others, and I dealt with quite a bit of running on the headpiece. Honestly, it's probably the worst paint job I've done since I was like 12 years old, but fortunately I was able to remove all of the paint bleed with some sanding after the paint had dried. All right, we're quickly going back in time to show you how I managed to get power up through Beatty's leg and to his head without any of the cables showing. I originally planned to cut a trench for the power cables before gluing all the leg pieces together, but in order to speed up the sanding and priming process, I decided to figure it out later. Fortunately, I was able to find this comically long drill bit at Harbor Freight, which allowed me to drill down through both right leg pieces starting with a small pilot hole so as not to crack the resin and eventually moving up to the big bit down through the center of the thigh into what is essentially the knee joint and then repeating the process on BD's calf and drilling straight through his ankle joint and out his foot. I feel like I've been using the words fine detail a lot, but honestly there was a lot of fine detailing when it came to BD's paint scheme. And in order to accomplish the task of all that fine detailing, I used a masking trick that I learned on YouTube. Essentially you mask right up to the line of the part that you want to paint. And from there, you carefully paint in using kids white craft glue, painting around all the details and up and over that masking tape that you've laid down. And once that's dry, you should be able to paint over everything. And once that paint is dry, you should be able to remove the masking tape and peel the glue away and you'll be left with a clean line. Here you can see I left the masking on until after I had dry brushed a metallic paint over the black and then begin dry brushing all of the black painted parts, slowly building up the metallic paint on the edges of the pieces until everything had a worn metal look. Once the metallic paint was dry, it was on to painting even more details. Here I am cutting two tiny square holes into the side of Beatty's head, which I then filled with a red dyed UV resin to act as little windows for lights on the side of his head. From there, I moved on to gluing magnets in place for his visor faceplate. And once the super glue had set, I used a five minute epoxy to further reinforce the position of the magnets, as well as adding a little 3D printed cup for the LED eyeball. And because I was tired of carefully doing all the little fiddly bits, I decided to quickly weather all the red painted pieces, making sure to remove paint from all the high points and any other spot that might easily be scratched. I glued in the two plates for the body and moved on to epoxying the feet in place. All right, we're going back in time once again to finalize how I got power up through Beatty's leg and into his head. Initially, I had hoped that it would be as simple as pulling the cable down through the leg using a wire I had previously fished through the leg channel. But this proved to be an almost impossible task and I legitimately spent probably an hour and a half to two hours fishing both the positive and negative wire up through his right leg. But finally, I got it. And it was on to fishing it through his right calf. I'll say again, this took a lot of time. But once I got both wires up his right leg, it was super easy to get them into the body and out his neck using another channel that I had drilled with the same drill bit. Now let's move on to adding sound. The idea to add a startup sound came fairly late in the process, and I accomplished it by using a recordable greeting card sound module. The sound module works when the little sensor is exposed to light, so I quickly added an extra LED to all the lights I had previously wired up and heat shrinked it to the sensor. 
and after adding my custom startup sound, I tested everything out. Once the sound had been figured out, I moved on to finalizing his projection lens eye. I removed the external casing from the projection lens and wrapped the rest of the assembly in HVAC tape. I also added a more robust wire and resistors to the little LED light at the back of the projection lens. And then I wired it up to my touchless infrared switch. From there, it was a lot of fiddling and fishing to get the entire assembly into Beatty's head and wired up properly. Once everything was slid into place, I went about adding the little red lights to the side of his head. Okay, on to the fun part, weathering. In this process, you really make your project your own. It's completely up to you how weathered your piece is. I tend to like to weather my stuff a bit on the excessive side, but it's really up to personal preference. I said in my last helmet build video that weathering is a bit of a cathartic process for me, and that definitely still held true for this one. This project was so much more involved than the helmet was. There were so many more moving parts and so many different paint colors and problems to solve, etc. And I spent so much time being focused on these nitty gritty details, making sure everything was perfect. But then I arrived to this point and I begin to willingly destroy my creation. But somehow in introducing the imperfection to the process, that's where the real character comes from. Because as I'm scraping and scratching and scuffing, I'm thinking, if this little robot were real and running around, where would he be getting scraped? What points would be getting more worn than others? Where would mud build up? Where would gunk build up? And where would rust build up? And that entire process begins to feel a bit like I'm a painter with a paintbrush or something. Um, not to wax too philosophical for what is essentially a glorified toy, but yeah, something about that process of introducing the imperfection in a randomized way is really what makes BD feel alive. And honestly, this is my favorite part of the process. It's totally up to you how much you weather your prop. You can go as light or as heavy as you want, but this is definitely the step that sells the life in your piece. I like to start with a brown wash with a little black mixed in. Wash the entire thing and then go back with a dark brown and black paint to kind of build up a little extra gunk in the joints. And from there, I'll go back with a brownish orange to add rust to all the exposed metal parts. Here you see I'm gluing in some little stabilizer spikes and sticking him down into a base that I made. This video is getting kind of long, and so I'll be releasing a separate video on how I made this base. So keep an eye out for that one. Once I was happy with the weathering, I quickly went back and installed the touchless infrared switch into BD's head. This will allow all of his electronics to be turned on with just a wave of the hand. And with that, BD was ready for his glamour shots. If you made it this far into the video, thank you very much for watching. I really appreciate it. Like I've said before, I'm a total beginner to the world of realistic prop building. And all of my knowledge 
is just learned from YouTube and internet forums. So I hope that this video inspires you to try something new or something that you've been interested in for a while. I hope you had fun watching. And again, thank you for sticking around to the end. If you want to see the projects I have coming next, make sure to subscribe and keep an eye out because I plan to drop a video every Saturday. Thanks again for watching. Have a good day.